Hi everyone, and welcome to the May webinar from the Frist Center for Autism and Innovation. Today, I'm here with the wonderful Dave Thompson. Uh, before we jump in, I want to remind everyone that these webinars are recorded and available on the Frist Center YouTube, usually in about a day, depending on where my brain is at. Um, if you have any questions for Dave during this, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A or the chat, and we will work them into the discussion. Uh, so a little about Dave. Dave is a self-advocate with ADHD, dyslexia, and sensory processing disorder. He is an educator, innovator, and advocate in the field of neurodiversity employment since 2010. He's currently the director of strategic programs for Potentia Workforce and supports companies in becoming more neuro-inclusive through training on best practices, as well as recruiting and providing ongoing support for neurodistinct professionals. Uh, his work is fed by the desire to see the world of work continue to evolve through increased opportunity, flexibility, empathy, acceptance, and support for neurodistinct professionals. He believes that diversity, including neurodiversity, makes the world a better, more productive, innovative, and understanding place. So today, I'm going to be talking to Dave about the idea of belonging as a neurodiverse individual in the workforce, and I'm super excited to talk to you, Dave, so let's get going. Uh, how are you doing? I'm good now. Thank you so much for having me and for the uh, incredible introduction. I really appreciate it. You are welcome. So can we start with maybe you telling us a bit about yourself and how you ended up at Potentia? Yeah, yeah, that's important. So we'll, we'll, uh, again, I'm, I'm Dave Thompson. I'm Director of Strategic Programs for Potentia. But I guess uh, more importantly, uh, who I am as far as my why. Um, I... I I am a neurodistinct self-advocate. I have ADHD, dyslexia, sensory processing issues, uh, left-right confusion, which is its own thing. And I've I've kind of kind of come to terms with that recently and gotten uh, tattoos of my left and my right on my hands, which I'm really proud of. Um, my five and a half year old is is better than that with that stuff than I am, uh, and I've realized that that's part of that's part of neurodiversity. Um, more recently, so I'm proud of that. Um, I grew up in special education classes, uh, separate class from a lot of my peers, um, and I've dealt with a lot of challenges due to how I'm wired. But uh, I think my biggest challenge was being raised based on kind of perceived or assumed inabilities um, or, you know, through a disability kind of lens when really now that I'm in my 30s, I realize that I'm actually super good at a bunch of stuff, um, to be honest. Uh, it, you know, and if you were to tell me after uh, dropping out of college for the third time, uh, that one day I'd be collaborating with one of the the biggest and best universities um, in the country or even the world. I probably wouldn't have believed you, uh, but but here we are. Uh, yeah, that, uh, the the strengths based perspective is something that we really uh, talk about a lot at the Frist Center and is super important, obviously, in in your growth. Um, I, I I love that you showed your hand tattoos there because I have the planets to remind me in my job. So that's all about remembering tattoos, remembering tattoos. I love it. Um, right. So uh, you, sorry, go on. No, I, I just, I, I had a, a little bit more to say there, but if yeah. you have a follow-up question. So, no. so just, I, I, I do think that the, the stress the 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 st stress, the strengths-based perspective is the biggest single kind of um, you know, movement for me and my life when we're talking about neurodiversity, realizing that, you know, um, I'm just different, right? So I feel like a lot of barriers for me were were put on me by others due to kind of um, the, you know, rigid culture of school or employment or whatever that we've built up over the years. Um, so wh when I did enter the workforce, the only thing I could kind of picture doing was to to put it in a kind of cliche way is to to be the person that I needed when I was younger or to be part of the solution. And I ended up in human services. Um, and and that brought me to helping to run the vocational support program at, a, at an awesome nonprofit in New York called Spectrum Designs Foundation, which is a mission driven social enterprise that employs mostly autistic adults. And that's where I realized that's where I learned about neurodiversity as a concept, first of all. And that's where I kind of realized uh, and things started to click for me where people were saying, you're really good at kind of looking at things backwards, upside down, inside out, creating these work systems, creating, uh, you know, uh, a, a more equitous workplace that kind of works for everybody. Um, 
and, and that's when I realized this was this was truly my calling. Um, and fast forward to now, I mean, that brought me to incredible conversations with some of the biggest companies in the world, many of whom are are, are friendly with with you guys over at Frist. Um, and and to meet my my boss and mentor Jeff Miller from Potentia, and now um, as director of strategic programs for Potentia, I help some of those biggest companies on the planet. Um, in in kind of uh, figuring out how to move the needle in this way, how to be more neuro inclusive uh, through hiring programs and and well beyond that. So that's what brings me here. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And I, I really love when um, people are honest about kind of the journey and the ups and downs. You said you like had issues in college. Like I, I can feel that. Um, and to be able to then show how successful you've become um, is is really important. I think. Um, but being honest about those that journey as well. Uh, could you tell us a bit about Potentia? Like, what does it do? What do you do at Potentia? Yeah. And on yeah. a, a larger, larger extent, what does the company do? <laughs> totally. And I just want to say, as to your last point, mm. I, I think it it speaks to vulnerability and the importance of vulnerability. And besides learning about neurodiversity and embracing my own neurodiversity, I think showing neurodiversity, uh, showing vulnerability as a leader and a trainer and an ally has been like the second most critical thing in in my you know I I, I love to lead with what I'm not good at I love to lead with with truly because it kind of opens conversations right up and opens people right up and that's what that I mean that's kind of what we're getting at um today a little bit I I, I didn't uh, make a note to talk about vulnerability but it is really important isn't it I think it is. I, I had a I had a singing teacher once who told me, in terms of singing, you're only as strong as your biggest weakness. And for some reason that stuck with me in other areas. And being vulnerable, I think, is a part of that. Like being able to be vulnerable about um your story and what your your strengths are. Um, because it kind of works the other way as well, you know? Right. Um, right. Yeah. But, um, so I could talk about that all day. <laughs> Yeah, we'll probably get back to it. But as for as for your question about what Potential Workforce is and what we do, uh, Potential was started in 2019 with the idea of, again, helping companies to become more neuroinclusive through programs and products. Um, and, and so I actually met uh, our CEO, Jeff Miller, at a Neurodiversity at Work roundtable conference in, in Florida, uh, where he was um, just getting started working with with some of those large global companies on their neurodiversity hiring initiatives. So um, let me actually share my screen, if I may, for a moment, and I could explain kind cool. of our, our two of our primary uh, programs. Can you see the screen that says stars? Yep, I can. I'll make sure everyone else can as well. Yeah. Um, so so our STARS program is kind of a, a core offering that we have ever since uh, 2019. And so we it focuses on recruitment. So when you talk about um, some of the, the the great programs like EY, which I know Frist is super familiar with, and, and Microsoft, um, having uh, special programs, neurodiversity hiring initiatives uh, for the last number of years, um, STARS kind of supports other companies in, in doing so. So the concentration is on recruitment. Uh, we we educate and support employers to successfully hire and retain neurodistinct talent. Uh, then we we recruit, we uh, we connect employers with highly qualified professionals, and then we train both parties uh, to maximize productivity, employee engagement, and long-term success through making sure everything's aligned, making sure everyone's on the same page and everything's a good fit. Uh, and then we actually provide you know ongoing support through weekly meetings and things like that to make sure whole teams feel supported. Um, so so that's stars. We've been doing that and doing that well for a long time. Uh, we just had a a cohort of twenty one new hires um, at a large global company, which was really exciting. Uh, we went from national to international in 2022 uh, through our STARS program. And now we have active uh, programs on four continents, which is really, really cool. Um, so that, that, that's that's kind of our bread and butter. That's what we've been doing for a while. Uh, and it's really, really exciting to train these teams and kind of give these neurodiversity 101 talks to uh, you know people in all different industries from all over the planet and and getting them invested in the idea of opening up their their companies and embracing all different kinds of of brains right and that it's to their benefit um 
so that's that that's something I love to do and something that we do really well I think um the the other thing is that we've learned a lot through these stars programs we've learned a lot through conversations with companies like Microsoft and EY and Mentra and all the other awesome um you know programs and projects that are going on right um and so through that we we have a lot of uh of a response of well there's a lot of neurodistinct people that work at the companies that aren't within these ND hiring programs and what about the overall experience of getting a job and keeping a job at a company at, at one of these companies beyond that initiative right so we launched uh, a program called empower that we're super proud of and that more focuses on the overall employee experience and employee retention um so use like it says here using concepts behind neurodiversity and inclusion at work uh and and you know kind of feedback from our clients and the needs of our clients that didn't really necessarily fall within our kind of off the shelf scope for our stars program um we've we've built a program around uh, engagement productivity retention uh employee belonging satisfaction things like that um and and yeah it's it's i love to go to corporate boardrooms and tell uh decision makers at corporations after i've already kind of impressed them that i would not even apply to their company right you're and, honest i love it well right i mean i mean and and it's the truth i mean um you know or huge global organizations are big and they're clunky and they're complicated for a reason but we're trying to kind of put the humanity back in 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 these companies and and uh as long as they have the buy-in and and realize that it really does benefit all you know organizations and workplaces to support the naturally existing differences in the minds of all of us um yeah we'll we'll, we'll be good to go right amazing that thank you have you got more slides on that that you'd like to speak on uh no no i'll stop sharing for now i might have okay. some more stuff later oh feel free just let me know um thank you for for letting us know about your programs that's awesome i think one of the things that always kind of speaks to me when when we're talking about these things is the idea of like retention we often do think about hiring neurodiverse folk but then how do we retain them and that kind of does bring us in i think to the conversation of belonging like you're not going to want to work somewhere where you don't feel like part of the the process right um so i think you know what what would you say for you as if you were a job seeker or someone who is being hired what does the idea of belonging mean to you as a neurodiverse person within the workforce um i like that i like my 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 neurodistinct job seeker hat and then my kind of uh professional working in the space hat separately that's neat so thanks um so Belonging to me means like I, you, you, a lot of people have described belonging without using the word to me as something, as, as a vibe, right? As something that you can't necessarily put into words, but just feeling okay, feeling welcome, feeling good about being at work every day. So to to kind of take out any of the jargon that I've learned along the way, which I'll get into in a, in a second, um, if I look at myself, you know, 15 years ago or so, and look at why I wouldn't have applied to or or why I would self select out uh, after my first interview at a big corporation or something like that, it would definitely be because I either didn't feel welcomed, didn't feel like I could truly join the team and feel like part of the team, uh, truly feel appreciated, um, and things like that. So that to me, if I'm looking at younger Dave, um, that that to me would be what a feeling of belonging would look like in, in the workplace. Does that do, do, does that resonate with you? No, absolutely. I think my immediate question from that is, can you describe any of the reasons why you would self-select out, or was it just a vibe, like you said? Um, I think. Uh, you know, everyone's different, right? There's, of course, neurodiversity, which I know you talk about monthly on on this on this program, but everyone's different. Everyone's personalities are different. And there's kind of this uh, very rigid world of work where we all kind of uh, use the same language and talk about the same, uh, you know, have the same small talk and 
um, do the same things all next to each other in pods all day, every day and things like that. And I just have never, I, I've always kind of needed to march to the beat of my own drum, right? So growing up, that was just seen as kind of disorganized, right? And I didn't get enough support and even as a young adult and within the world of work, didn't get enough support or encouragement in exploring what I'm good at, exploring what sets, sets me up for success, right? And instead, it's just like, this is our definition of a meaningful experience at school or work. This is our definition of what it means to be productive, what it means to be good. This is the job description. You either hit all 20 bullet points or you don't. Um, and, and so that's not me. I have a lot now I know. Uh, putting uh, my 2023 hat on, now I know that I have a lot to contribute to the world of work, but it's not something like payroll. I I won't and I can't. And when I first entered the world of work, moving up meant managerial positions where I'd have to do payroll. I could be a leader and I could serve the organization in all sorts of elevated ways from where I was in my ent entry level position, but I could, cannot and should not do anything with numbers, nothing that matters. <laughs> so that kind of stuff would absolutely make me self-select out. Interesting. Okay. So like, I, I understand what you're saying here as you kind of move up, especially in these more corporate spaces, which is obviously not a space I remember is a, um, they're often very, um, they, they come with these requirements, even once you're in the job, they come with these requirements in order to move up. Um, and maybe those are too rigid and maybe they don't work for everybody. And some people can kind of just go, okay, well, I'll do the thing. Um, but if you don't want to do the thing, if you don't feel like you're the right person to do the thing, uh, I think that speaks to not just like neurodiverse folk, but everyone, mm -hmm. right? Like we, if we play, if we use everyone to their strengths, we're going to get a better, we're going to get a better situation, aren't we? Um, right. Right. And, 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 yeah. and, you know, the, I feel like belonging is, is kind of this, no matter what kind of group you come from, what your experiences are, a lot of those things in, in, in diversity, equity, and inclusion are really difficult to measure. You can measure them on, you know, proactive hiring initiatives or something like that. But the question, do you feel like you belong in your position at your company on this team? It is a, a definite, measurable uh, question. And it doesn't matter whether you're from an underserved group or you're self-disclosing at work or you're not, you know, uh, because that would be how they take those metrics involving diversity and inclusion, right? Um, whether or not, you know, a company's belonging scores kind of gets at all of that stuff, right? It's at the intersection of, of diversity, equity, inclusion. Right. I imagine it's hard to, I don't know if you guys do any work on this potential, but I want, I, I would like to know how you quantify that because yeah, you're right. That question is like answerable and measurable, but because it means something different to everyone. And mm -hmm. then how can companies, you know, how can companies make that a reality for everybody? I know it's possible, but that sounds like when you think about it in like an umbrella or like an overarching idea, it sounds insanely hard. Right. Because everyone is different. Right. And you can't just tick a box and decide whether someone is having a meaningful employment experience or not. Like like things like moving up, like uh, a huge company measures uh, internal, uh, you know, um, moving up the corporate ladder. Right. And maybe that's not what somebody wants. Maybe somebody's work goals have been accomplished just by coming in at nine and leaving at five and and they don't want to add the extra stuff that that shouldn't be necessarily a signifier of whether or not that's been a successful uh you know employee right that that they right. stay that they stay forever or that they move up or they move over or they upscale or anything like that um to some people you know they they're doing what they want to do and that that's a wonderful thing so that that's kind of a good example that i think definitely leads to this idea of of what your definition of success is right like for me at least belonging is hand in hand with like how successful do I feel I'm being in my in my job whatever that job is um and success is also kind of measured in these in these odd ways that corporations are and I, I get it to a point because you've got these big corporations and there has to be a way to kind of quantify things right you can't 
go around and talk, but well, maybe you could, but maybe we should go around and talk to all 45,000 employees or whoever, if you're talking about these really, really huge companies. Um, is that a big number of employees? I'm not sure. Yeah, you know, yeah, totally. And, and one of the things that we're actually doing within power is, is how do you measure success if you don't measure, right? So you have to ask those questions. And um, what, what, you know, I keep my ear very close to the ground as far as what some of the best um, neuroinclusive companies are doing. And uh, a huge thing is assessing belonging and psychological safety and stuff, which I'd like to get into um, mm. through, through a third party kind of survey platform. And actually, you know, a lot of companies are nervous to do that because they're nervous about having to act on the results and having to fix it and knowing the answer, right? But um, that that's a big part of what we're doing with the Empower program. It, uh, I'm going to share my screen one more time and yeah. just talk about uh, how I like to explain belonging and psych safety. Absolutely. Uh, and, I would and, love to hear about psych safety. Yeah. And would you play a game with me too? Really oh, quick. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, so like, spot, I, yes, like, like I like like I kind of said how I see um you know, belonging is kind of you know at the intersection of uh you know ensuring diversity uh equitous uh, practices um inclusive hiring right um and and making sure people are feeling included you can include people and they might not they still might not feel a sense of belonging at work mm -hmm. just because people are in the door doesn't mean that it's a, a good work experience, right? Um, and so yeah. what it says here, what it says here is an organization that kind of uh, cultivates this culture of belonging, uh, engages the full potential of the individual, the employees, uh, where innovation thrives and views, beliefs, and values are integrated. So uh, that brings me into, you know, when, when we want to talk about actionable steps that companies can take, uh, I can't talk about belonging without talking about psychological safety. So let's let's play a game step into my time machine for a moment would you okay okay will i need so, my glasses will you need your glasses <laughs> yeah. i'm not sure whatever sets you up for success you can bring along glasses okay um oh you were asking literally okay yeah so so let's go back to your first job or your worst job whichever one is kind of more interesting your first job or your worst job? And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions if that's okay. Go for it. You don't have to tell me where it was. So did you, did you feel like you were part of one big team from top to bottom and that you were appreciated as a, as a true member of a, a needed member of, of a team? At the worst job I've ever had. No, not mm -hmm. at all. Okay. Uh, did you feel okay or safe in asking questions absolutely not daily panic attacks making mistakes could not make mistakes not an option okay so i'm going to assume you couldn't ask for extra help or seek support <laughs> no i was assumed that i knew everything okay which is not the case ever okay uh, interesting right i feel the same way i was a bus okay. boy i was a bus boy um at an italian restaurant um, did you feel like you were welcomed and encouraged to contribute in meaningful ways, like really bringing Jessica to work and contributing in the ways that, that really exhibited your strengths? Um, uh, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> yes less desirable to that specific organization strength no <laughs> <laughs> okay and did you feel um like all of your contributions were taken seriously that you were credited properly for your contributions that you felt good about it and it benefited both you and your employer some of the contributions that again were in line with what was appropriate for the company yes those were very much credited the ones that were not in their eyes useful were not credited but okay. in my eyes were useful if that makes I, sense i really like your thoughtful responses these are very enthusiastic okay. responses thank you and that brings me to kind of my last subsection of questions which would okay. be did you feel okay raising your hand and saying I disagree. 
for example. Oh, no, 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 no. Cannot disagree. Right. So, so like, I know you use Windows, but I'd like to use Mac. I know you use Google Calendar, hypothetically, but I like to use iCal, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I know you keep the ice cream on that side of the room, but if you keep it over here, it'll melt slower as they go pay on the way out the door, right? Something like mm-hmm. that. Could you raise your hand and say, I don't get it. I see it a different way. No? I I would say it because I have no filter, but it would not be received well. Right. And there's a difference so between there's a difference between having psychological safety and being able to say it and saying it anyway, right? In like a toxic right. work environment. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And, and so yeah. some people say, Yeah, I gave them a piece of my mind. And that might be a little bit different. You know what I mean? Yeah. So so what I'm getting at here are the the four kind of stages of psychological safety, which we just kind of walked through. So foundational to psych safety in the workplace would be inclusion safety, not whether or not you're included, right? Because like we said earlier, you can be included and still not feel a sense of belonging, but rather, do you feel included as part of a team? Do you feel valued and taken seriously as a member of the the crew or do you feel like oh there was a certain vibe before i walked in and now i'm here and it just feels like them and me or something like that right that that's important and that's foundational and usually when you don't have that you don't you don't have the rest um right. so learner safety can i mess up can I ask questions? Can I say, I know you explained this to me verbally, but can you also email it to me? Can I bring this manual home and read it over the weekend? Um, I know you said to do it this way verbally, and then you didn't write me notes, and now I've made a mistake, even though I asked for notes, or I didn't ask for notes, right? Um, I need support. I'm not okay at work, right? that's learner safety. Uh, And if you don't have learner safety, you probably won't get to the next kind of section, contributor safety. Am I welcome to contribute? Are my contributions taken seriously? Am I credited properly for my contributions? Um, Am I contributing in a a way that's mutually beneficial? Is it filling my cup and filling the cup of my employer? That's hard. That's, That's hard stuff to align, to be honest. I mean, I very much feel that way and they don't just pay me to say it. I really, really do um, at my job. But I don't think many people can say that, right? That, That they're really contributing in the ways that they find meaningful, that they're passionate about, and that's valuable to their employer. Um, And then lastly, challenger safety. That's just being able to raise your hand and say, nope, I disagree, right? Right. I love this pyramid. This is mm-hmm. super interesting. I've, I've never thought about it in this way. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm interrupting. No, no, okay. no, 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 absolutely. <laughs> I, I, this, this, this gets me. So this is one of my favorite slides to, to, to show people and, and kind of uh, every, it's one of those things where things start to click and everyone just agrees. It's not, you know, um, I know, you know, a lot about rocket science. I assume this isn't rocket science. It's, it's, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Right. Um mm-hmm. So, and as far as that cultivating that challenger safety, that's especially important for neurodistinct people, right? Because right. we do we do see things backwards, upside down, inside out, twice as fast, slowed down, zoomed out, zoomed in. And that's to the benefit of our employer. We, we talk a lot about things like autism and innovation and being naturally innovative, but that's not necessarily the next big tech app or the next cure for a disease or something like that. It's also just efficiency and problem solving and just seeing things from a different angle. Right. Right. And, and so it's really, really important to do that. And I, I happen to to know, um, uh, I don't know the details, unfortunately, the exact numbers, but Ernst and Young, when they first started their neurodiverse centers of excellence, right during their onboarding training, they really stressed this challenger safety and said, please, new hires feel comfortable challenging us feel comfortable asking questions telling us what we should do different and right then someone raised their hand and what they brought up has ended up saving Ernst and Young millions and millions of dollars because it was it was some sort of you know ability that they had to see, see a problem from a different angle um and so it, it's important for us as neurodistinct people but it's also awesome 
for an employer, right? Right. And that's what employees employers want, really, isn't it? Um, yeah. So there's actually a question here in the chat, and I really like it because it is, I, I, it, I resonate with it. So do you mind if I read it to you or no. for everybody else? Okay. So it's kind of long, but I do think it would be really an interesting thing to talk about. So this attendee has said, I did so good at masking unknowingly throughout my career and hit a breaking point a couple of years ago, which led to a diagnosis as autistic. I'm now an associate director at my company and realized how so much of my job contributes to my autistic burnout. Since I got my diagnosis, it's been so hard to be able to unmask at work because everyone knew me before I am autistic and before I knew I am autistic and my boss has the same expectations of me. I'm really at the point of feeling like I need to quit because I don't think I can do the job anymore without any accommodations being made. Do you have any advice for late identified autistic people who have been successful in their career due to harmful masking and making a transition to something more suitable? They've said, I understand if this question isn't relevant, but I think it really is. And I resonate with it a lot because I'm in a, I'm in a similar situation in my career where I've been late diagnosed. Um, and I feel very similarly in that now, I want to have accommodations that I didn't, and I get them, that I didn't previously realize I needed. And I think that's really important. Yeah. I mean, you you might be able to speak to it a little bit better than me. I mean, I was diagnosed as, as a kid and I'm also not autistic, but I can say this, I didn't come into the world of work identifying in that way and leading with the way I introduced myself today. That's not how I uh, was thinking, and it's not how I was uh, introducing myself for sure. Uh, in fact, the first time that I uh, I was I was giving homework help at a group home that I worked at at my first big boy job after college, um, and it was I was helping a, a young uh, man with ADHD get through his math homework, and I said, "Listen, I'm really bad at math too. I have ADHD," and I was brought into the office by my supervisor and advised not to talk about that at work. Um, and I didn't for another ten years. I got off the TED. I get. I got off the TED Talk stage, uh, where I talked about neurodiversity at work, having failed to mention that I was neurodivergent myself. So, you know, this is. I. I I'm. Uh, I'm not one to to. Um, to preach how important and critical it is for people to disclose at work because everyone that's a very personal decision and it's highly highly involved. Um, but what I would say is um, my my boss and, and mentor, Jeff Miller, says something that I really like. He says, we can learn the lessons and lose the label, which means in order to have a more empathetic and flexible understanding workplace, we can just talk about what we need, right? And it doesn't have to be based on any sort of... Um, identity that we carry along with ourselves to be now now is this easy no still depending on the environment absolutely not but i need noise canceling headphones at a private place to work in order to be productive right desperately like uh, do i like going on work trips and having conferences and things like that of course but i'm not going to get certain critical parts of my job done if i'm not completely by myself wearing noise canceling headphones I don't, I, you know, if I was to work at some big corporation, I shouldn't need to lead with my ADHD or dyslexia or sensory processing issues card to be able to work in a private environment with noise canceling headphones. It should just be able to be, I need to work in a private environment with noise canceling headphones, right? Um, so I, I wouldn't necessarily like bunch the two together, no matter what, we could talk about what we need without talking about diagnosis or, or you know even why you know what i mean yeah no but, i agree i agree i'm gonna um because i if you don't mind i would like to talk a bit to that to this question that the attendees given um because i resonate a lot with it i was you know working up in my career before i was diagnosed and i spent a lot of time masking and it also led to burnout and panic attacks and misdiagnosed anxiety depression things like that and it is, I, I can resonate with where this person is because I've been through this. Um, I don't know who this person is because it's anonymous, but what I am gonna do is put my email in the chat. And if that person wants to reach out to me, um, I would love to hear from them and I would love to support them in that um, because I get it. <laughs> but know that with, you know, you, there is a way through it. Um, 
at least there was for me and I hope it can be the same for others as long as there's an inclusive environment um there's all oh, there's another question that's popped up that I think is interesting but before that I do want to ask you um because we've been talking a little bit about you said oh well we should just be able to say I want to sit somewhere with a you know noise cancelling headphones and you're right that should be that should be an easy accommodation to make for anyone right not just someone who's neurodiverse and I think this speaks to the kind of rising tide lifts all boats scenario in that if we help neurodiverse folk we will help everyone right um and so what do, do you think are where how do we create a neuroinclusive workplace culture in that way where thinking about kind of accommodations that people need and thinking about how to improve it for everyone but with nd in mind yeah for sure um but i i think for starters you know most of our experience has been with with doing these stars initiatives um where we're doing proactive neurodiversity hiring initiatives now does that support every single neurodistinct person directly no but i will say that that's been a great way for companies to dip their toes in to having truly fully neuroinclusive workplaces, right? Um, because that gets the conversation going and it's ensuring that this team and this cohort of people are properly supported. We're talking about it. We're figuring out what it means to be neurodistinct at Microsoft, let's say, um, and what it takes, you know, what kind of... Um, resources, community, et cetera, uh, what kind of leadership best practices and all that stuff um, are needed in order to, to make this successful. And then there's kind of this ripple effect um, where people learn about these best practices. They truly work for everyone. We have not had, I don't think we've had any programs, any pilot programs where some leader has not actually raised their hand and said, I wasn't sh planning on talking about this, but I actually got diagnosed as autistic last year or something like that. So those programs are, are helpful. Um, but, you know, part of the reason why we launched Empower is to, to scale that and to take that knowledge and to really truly embed it into entire organizations, right? Um, I would say just kind of that alignment from day one on what, uh, what, an employee can expect out of an employer and what an employer can expect out of an employee. Um, I really feel like job interviews and that kind of process of getting a job should just as much be uh, a reverse interview and see, you know, you determining whether that company is the kind of company that you want to work for. Right. Um, uh, clarity on expectations, um, context, lots of context, the more the better, not everyone needs it, right? Uh, but some people will take that 300 page manual home over the weekend, read the whole thing and understand the telescope better than I ever could because they read the book and I only watched the 90 second YouTube video, right? So <laughs> as much context as possible is really, really important. Um, uh, normalizing success enablers, which you've probably talked about uh, uh, you know, um, on, on previous webinars, I know Mentra is using that term now, um, you know, flexibility in, sh in how people get their jobs done. So we already talked about my headphones or, um, not using fluorescent lights, using LEDs or my standing desk or something like that. My fidget spinners that are all over the place, right. Um, normalizing things as, as simple as this can be really, really important. And also, oh, I, I see that. I forget what that's called, but it's from Star Wars. It's my I know. Squishy R2D2. There you go. Squishy R2D2. Re <laughs> regards. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So just normalizing the how, right? We want to be very clear on the what, what we're expecting from each other. We want to give a lot of context as to that that why, right? Lots of reasons, right? We've kind of gone, gone over those. And then as much flexibility as as the how, right? I take the squiggly route to get places. That doesn't mean I don't get there the same as everybody else. And it's actually to our co the company's benefit that I take the squiggly route, right? Um, so I, I think that those are some of the, the really big areas. Besides that, re redefining what it means to have a meaningful work experience from, from employer standpoint, right? So that's, that's an individual decision. What a meaningful day of work uh, for me, looks like might be way different from somebody else. When you think about the corporate world and you think about cubicles, people have a very negative idea around what cubicle life is like. Meanwhile, aside from the corner office, uh, which I would love, I'll take a cubicle 
over now there's these modern workplaces that you know you think about when you think about like a modern tech company like like you know google which is a great company um and you think about how you know there's these co-working spaces where oh i have to find somewhere to work today it's not the same place as i i was working yesterday uh this time it's next to the sushi station that will be a burrito place next week and there's a ball pit next to me and i took my scooter here like that is that's really fun but that's not my idea of a, a a workplace that that works for me right so that's an individual kind of decision and preference what what uh what sets everyone up for success right and also what a team player is right is it somebody that goes to happy hour that that's not a good barometer for whether or not someone's a team player or part of the part of the crew or whatever you know what i mean maybe i don't want happy birthday sung to me i like it but a lot of people don't right i love it but a lot of people don't my birthday's my birthday sunday but but a lot of people don't um, right i i'm laughing because i completely i completely agree with this um for me that uh the ball pit sushi stand open work <laughs> scenario sounds like <laughs> sounds like a nightmare <laughs> um yeah I, I love being in my little office on my own at home with my dogs uh we actually have a bunch <laughs> but speaking of wait before we get to the question mm -hmm. this is important our work experiences are vastly different so we haven't really mm -hmm. I, I would like for you to answer the same question like to me I like conferences, I like speeches, I like connecting with people, but in order to be, I'm probably three times as productive and happy, more importantly, and happy and satisfied as an employee since going remote in 2020. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, since being able to set up my office exactly in the messy way that works for me, writing down whatever I want on my big messy standing desk, that is what sets me up for success. And I found a lot of happiness and success in that way. What does that look like for you? Because I know that your employment situation is really interesting. So I have to ask you. Okay, I'm willing to answer because you are. Um, <laughs> so uh, the the references that Dave has made throughout this webinar for telescopes is because I'm actually an astrophysicist. That's my first kind of thing. And I, I sometimes bring this up on the webinar, sometimes don't. So for new people, that, that's why. Uh, so I'm a doctoral candidate. I'm studying my PhD in astronomy. Uh, and I study at Vanderbilt, but I live in Hawaii. So I work completely remotely from my office in my house. And I also have a sounding desk covered in stuff, um, which I love. Um, but as you were saying, like I, I, I also do some night work at one of the telescopes here on Mauna Kea, which are some of the um, kind of biggest and best telescopes in the world. And I, when I go into the telescope overnight to do observations, I absolutely adore being on my own, not having to talk to anyone, and getting really good work done. I get to do people's science for them. And I also get to kind of have my laptop and I get a lot of my writing done, a lot of my paper writing, a lot of my kind of coding and like the kind of hardcore astro stuff done that isn't emails, um, you know, when I'm in that position. Um, and for, so for me, that is a perfect work environment, you know, like either at home in my office with no distractions other than my dogs or at the telescope, in the middle of the night without any of my notifications going off. Um, I had something else, but it's, it's left my mind now. Uh, but actually what's interesting about um, what you said there about being able to kind of uh, know what makes you productive and choosing that, that route is, and being happy in that route, is that at my old job where I was doing something very similar um, to what I do now um, in terms of astronomy, uh, I wasn't, given a lot of the accommodations I needed and I was very unhappy and what's really interesting is when I look at my what I do now my productivity my my time in the office my time at my desk has dropped but the amount I get done my productivity and my output has skyrocketed and so much of that I think for me at least is being happy and being valued and feeling like I belong um and those simple things that my employers can do for me benefits them because my output is so much bigger um but i will stop there because this is not the just show um because we have some good comments in the q a someone is wishing <laughs> you a happy early birthday dave mm. i would sing to you but it's not going to happen <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's one attendee has said here uh, regarding the previous question that we asked 
Um, thank you so much for this question and this comment. I want to say you're not alone. Your comment made me cry as I'm currently in the exact same situation. Masking has been a huge part of my life and it's exhausting. And again, I've put my email in the chat. If anyone wants to talk about masking, I'm here for you because I feel that deep in my soul, <laughs> especially as a woman, a uh, neurodiverse woman. Um, there is another question though. If I was hired by a disability organization and I'm neurodiverse with comorbidities, I always worry about truly feeling included as my staff might have one perspe uh, perspective of dis disabled people uh, needing services versus offering services. How would I navigate this to truly show my team that I can contribute and be a valued member of the team? That's a really great and valid uh, question and concern that you have. Unfortunately, it shouldn't really be, the burden shouldn't just be on neurodistinct people to make this all work, right? And to feel comfortable. I can speak to how to, you know, how I want to shape the world of work and how we're supporting organizations. But overall, um, whenever I get to, you know, address, generally my audience is uh, decision makers, managers, and some of them are, are distinct, but, you know, they're not the necessarily the people that we're talking about when we're talking about benefiting from a program like Potentia's. Um, but whenever I do get to talk to neuro, neurodistinct people like new hires for these companies and people like that, I like to say that we're not the problem. Um, the world of work is the problem and the way things are set up is the problem. Um, and, you know, we need to kind of rebrand this, this idea uh, that this is a favor or that it's, you know, um, anything besides just beneficial, the right thing to do and the smart thing to do for companies to be, to be doing this. Um, so I, I feel like maybe not to put a label on anybody, but that might be a little bit of like imposter syndrome. I mean, I definitely feel a lot of imposter syndrome. Uh, and I know that other people are in a worse off boat than me. Um, millennials feel a ton of imposter syndrome. Any underserved uh, group has really high levels of that. And just feeling like you're faking it or you're not worth it or people aren't taking you seriously. Um, and uh, to that, um, I say that those feelings are normal. It wouldn't be, it would be almost weird. Uh, and you know, you notice when someone doesn't feel any of that in their life and you say, look at that person, like they're very confident, right? You wouldn't want that. So you, I, I think making, making peace with that feeling, honoring that feeling and kind of minimalizing that feeling and saying, that's just, you know, these embedded feelings that I'm, that I've gained from my upbringing or my culture or my past experiences or whatever, that's not me. I'm worthy of work. Um, and you know, a, something like a job coach or a program or support is just like any other, it's just like my noise canceling headphones or anything like that. It just creates an equitous work experience for the user, right? Um, so that's, that's how those things should be looked at. That said, I feel you and I know it's, <laughs> I, you know what I mean? Like I, I, I yeah. know that this is, um, and that's why, like I mentioned before, we should be interviewing our companies, our employers just as much as, as they should be interviewing us. Right. There was a, I, I completely agree with everything you just said. There's a, um, I, I was just rereading the question, um, and they say, you know, they say about people might have a, pers a certain perspective of, of kind of what it means to provide disabled services versus actually offering the services, how people perceive things. And um, I think something that you kind of touched on there um, that I, for me, at least is something really important is I feel comfortable in talking about my autism um, and being honest about like how I think I have a lot of strengths in that way. And I would never ask someone obviously to say something that they're not comfortable saying, but I do think it can be good for people within companies to be like, hey, like this is how I am and look at all the awesome things I can do if that is something you feel comfortable doing. You know, like something I would say to this person is if they felt comfortable, mm -hmm. you know, talking about it and being like, hey, maybe the, the preconceptions you have are not consistent with reality. You know, like, especially, when you know when I found out I was autistic and, and some of my friends who've been through similar situations I had preconceptions you mm -hmm. know I was like how wait I don't like look like an autistic person right like I don't I'm a woman and I'm 
you know, I talk a lot and like all these kind of notions that we have about what it means to be autistic, either perpetuated by the media or society or culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that can be, you know, actually just have it, having those conversations can be really helpful, but in the same breath, making sure that you feel safe, making sure that you are doing things that are, you know, that it's, it's not going to be bad for you in any way. Um, yeah. So you got me thinking now I'm on my, on my little thought train, trying to not just ramble. Uh, <laughs> I d- oh, we have 10 minutes. Wow. Um, I did have one more question on the list here that I will ask and I will keep monitoring the chat. Um, how can companies, we've kind of talked about this, um, and actually this is kind of leads on from what we've just said. How can companies empower their neurodiverse employees to drive lasting change and maintain a culture of belonging? Um, yeah, I do you know now that we've now that we've just said what we've said, I think it is important to mention that we shouldn't put the onus on minority groups to force all the change. No, sense. but but historically, there's been so much conversation about us without us, right? And so yes, much we've, yeah. we've we've moved from a, a a society of exclusion where it was, you know, go figure it out, go live in the woods, go or or <laughs> warehousing people that thought differently, right? to to segregation which is like um you know separate schools separate workplaces closed workshops and things like that sheltered workshops below minimum wage pay and things like that into integration which is sure you can go to the same school as your sister but you're going to be in a different classroom and you're going to go on a different bus which is more my experience into this inclusive inclusive uh movement uh, and there's all different ways to do that. Again, you can be included and not feel good, right? So yeah. um, so it's so, so important that we're driving that change and that companies are empowering employees to speak up and say uh, how to talk about how they feel, seek support and things like that. So a few a few things that come to mind would be uh, employee resource groups, um whether formal or you know there's plenty of good kind of informal employee resource groups um that are sprouting up at at big companies especially big companies with these neurodiversity hiring initiatives um you know there are companies with about a hundred people in their neurodiversity hiring initiative and three thousand people in their uh their slack chat or whatever um you know with with all different subgroups around diagnosis experience like autistic women newly diagnosed imposter syndrome uh sensory issues rejection sensitivity um so just being able to find uh you know people with with similar experiences and and seek support in that way uh internal kind of subject matter experts on on those things and internal resources where you say you want to talk about um autism in Austro- in astronomy you got to talk to Jessica right like um that that's awesome uh and and then those kind of groups can help to shape policy and help to move things forward um a lot of the time what we've seen uh not necessarily companies that we've worked at, at but w- with but with uh some initiatives are there's some sort of decision maker that's really passionate about doing this and then either because of the economy or because that one decision maker moves on or something like that, things kind of fall a little flat. Um, but when you empower neurodistinct people and create something that's sustainable and ongoing, that's going to be way better. Also, just listening to your employees. A big part of Empower is uh, you know, employee surveys and things like that. Um, we want to be asking questions and we want to be asking questions in a way that makes people feel safe. So, you know, anonymous surveys and things like that. And also curating times and spaces where managers and teams do talk about things like mental health and neurodiversity at work. Um, making that part of your culture. And again, of course, this is an extremely nuanced topic because you could check a box and do that. And in a certain work environment, people are not going to feel safe talking about it and they're not going to tell the truth. And then the surveys look great, you know, so um, complicated, sure. Uh, but but uh, yeah. we we, we want to make sure that this is not just something that we say we accomplished back in 2023. And now we're a neuro inclusive place to work. This is an ongoing constantly evolve even the language that i was using a year ago is not the language i'm using now right this is a constantly evolving 
um, thing. So I, I think that it definitely involves uh, empowering the the neurodistinct people that work for your company. Absolutely. And, and I think with those, you know, when you have those neurodistinct people who are willing to do that work inside your company to, to credit them with the, the, you know, the fact that they're doing those things, there's a lot of kind of, you know, that's, that's a lot of extra work a lot of the time to yeah. form these groups and stuff. Right. And, and, and we don't want it to just be, you know, we, when we talk about our program and power, we talk about retention, it's not just the people that are working at the company now that uh, we want it to be a good place to work for. We want it to be an employer of choice for neurodistinct people. We want from, from the jump people to apply for that role and feel good about it from their recruiting processes, interview processes, you know, all, all, all of these things, the way they talk about neurodiversity you know, the way the the way the company talks about neurodiversity, do they address it? How do they address it? How often do they address it? What kind of resources are available? How they talk about it is actually really, really important, right? Mm, um, you know, it's it's it needs to be a holistic company wide look at what it means to be neurodistinct at your your place of work right and from from the moment they see the job description where they find the job description all the way through um career pathing you know upward mobility within the organization uh how they receive feedback how they receive their reviews how they're compensated etc right yeah absolutely um we have we have like four minutes left um so i would like to i know we could chat all day couldn't we Dave? so i would like to ask is there anything okay so closing all this out thinking about everything we've said what would be kind of a takeaway about belonging at work or if, if you were talking to you know neurodiverse folk like some of the people we've had in the chat um thinking about how to approach neurodiversity at work and belonging what have you got any kind of key thoughts anything you would want to leave us with it's never over the belonging what isn't oh <laughs> belong like <laughs> Belonging, I, I think I just kind of said it, but belonging or psychological safety at work is not something that you kind of accomplish and you get a certificate to put on your wall and then you're a good place to work, right? Belonging and psychological safety are individual relationships that employers have with employees. And it's it's an individual and like daily accomplishment that Jessica felt a sense of belonging and psychological safety at the telescopes today. And she will tomorrow and she's going to stay here. And, you know, and, and uh, that kind of having that kind of uh, never getting too comfortable around this, this topic is, is really, really important. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because it, it is, it is evolving. It is a living, breathing thing. It means something different for, for every single person. So we have to develop best practices and strategies to kind of self-assess and evolve along with that. And 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 also to make it an individualized relationship with between em employer and employee, you know. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, I oh, we've got two more minutes. Let's keep going. So, <laughs> uh, I really I really appreciate your time today, Dave. And I will make sure that this uh, webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube. Um, I would also love it if you could send over those slides. I really want the I really want the little triangle one for my wall. Um, but I'd like to also thank everyone who came today and asked questions. And please, I'll send this link out, and everyone can can go ahead and watch. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, time. thank thank you. This has Always been uh, re really special to me to be a part of. Uh, I'm right down the street from Vanderbilt, by the way. Oh, but you're not right you're in Hawaii, no but, but i'm i'm visiting in a few weeks maybe we should all come say hi absolutely and and any time uh that we can get uh potentia and and frist center together uh is is really really special and preferred for us so thank you thank you so much and um if anyone has any specific questions for me uh i'm easy to reach out to as well i'll i'll make sure jessica puts my email or something in on uh, with the youtube link mm -hmm. um and check us out at potentialworkforce.com and on linkedin or wherever else you get your social media plugging i love it plugging those pluggables Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And yeah. I will see you all. I'll see you very soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye.